Welcome to the EKG Guy. If this is your first time, I'm glad you could join us. If you're returning, welcome back. So we're going through the EKG Coding Reference Guide, and we're making our way through the Rhythm section, which is this section, Part 2. Okay, we've gone through Part 1, where we looked at general features of the EKG, normal EKG, and different atrial abnormalities, both left and right atrial enlargement. Now we've gone through rhythms. We've made our way through sinus rhythms, atrial rhythms, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. Uh, now we are on to our way to finishing junctional rhythms, okay? And we'll look at junctional tachycardia uh, in this lecture. Now, those of you that don't have access to our EKG coding reference guide, simply go to this link here, okay? You'll get to this point where you'll put your email in, click submit, check your email. In your email, you'll get a link to click. And from the link, you'll have access to this. If you're returning, you could simply do the th same thing, press submit and then you'll have access. You don't have to go through that whole email thing just for a first time. So let's get started. So AV junctional tachycardia, okay? So we've gone through a number of these junctional rhythms and all having a similar, uh, you know, onset of where they originate from, and that's at the AV nodal junctional region, okay? So if we just draw our box diagram just to refresh ourselves, here's our right atrium, our left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle, all right. And then we have our sinus node up here. We have our internodal fibers that come to the AV node. So this is the sinus node. This is the AV node. You have a Bachman bundle that goes to the left atrium. You have from the AV node, the His bundle that gives off this right bundle branch. Then you have the left bundle branch on the left ventricle that innervates it. And then you have a left anterior fascicle innervating the anterior and superior portions of the left ventricle, and then a left posterior fascicle that innervates the posterior and inferior aspects of that left ventricle. So when we talk about these junctional rhythms, we're talking about the rhythm originating from this region here, okay, uh, specifically. And that can include the AV node, the His bundle, and the, some of the Purkinje fibers, the ventricular Purkinje system. And we have to note that there's that normal physiologic delay at the AV node that allows for filling of the ventricles. When we talk about these AV junctional rhythms, they're differentiated based on the rate. Remember, we've been saying that the ventricular rate dictates the name of the rhythm. Remember that the sinus node has an intrinsic rate of about 60 to 100 beats per minute. All right, there's a lot of gap junction cells that allow for the flow of the impulse faster. Whereas if you get to the AV node, Okay, there are some gap junction cells that surround it, but there are not as many, and that allows for the delay. And the intrinsic rate of this AV junctional region is between 40 and 60 beats per minute on average. When we talk about the ventricular cells, those have a more slower uh, intrinsic rate between 20 and 40 beats per minute. Okay, and those are just some estimates. So when we differentiate these rhythms, okay, uh, specifically those coming from this junctional region, we have to do that based on the rate. So these junctional rhythms, we differentiate them based on rate, okay? So less than 40 beats per minute is slow, okay? We said this is kind of that normal range, 40 to 60 beats per minute. Now 60 to 100 beats per minute is faster but not a tachycardia. Remember, that would be over 100 beats per minute. So in these cases, if we have a junctional rhythm, okay, where we have a regular narrow complex tachycardia or uh, rhythm, so usually the QRS complexes are narrow, less than 120 milliseconds, uh, but they can be wide if you have already an underlying intraventricular conduction delay or you have some aberrant conduction. But if the rate is less than 40 beats per minute, we call that a junctional bradycardia, okay, slow rhythm. If we have one that is between 40 and 60 beats per minute, we call that a junctional rhythm because it's simply at that normal intrinsic rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. If we have one that is between 60 and 100 beats per minute, fast but not super fast, we call that an accelerated junctional rhythm. And then one over 100 beats per minute, we call that a junctional 
tachycardia, okay? And it's this one here that we want to focus on and look at this example here. So again, the ventricular rate dictates the name of the rhythm. We're looking at this one over 100 beats per minute, AV junctional tachycardia. So remember, what you have is the impulse originating. Imagine it originating from somewhere here, okay? It'll go anti-gradely down the uh, ventricular system and innervate the ventricles. That's anterograde conduction. And there's also retrograde conduction that can occur in which you may actually see P waves. So the QRS complexes occur because of the ventricular depolarization, but you also may have some retrograde conduction to the uh, atria causing atrial depolarization and P waves resulting. Now, because they're almost happening simultaneously, they may be buried within one another. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Another thing to note is notice if you do have P waves, they tend to be going away from their normal conduction system uh, pathway. So remember the normal conduction should go this, this way from the sinus node towards the AV node. But if you have retrograde conduction, you can imagine it going in the opposite direction. So you may see actually inverted P waves in those inferior leads, all right? And maybe an upright P wave in lead AVR. So let's look at this example here. We have a rhythm that appears to be fast, and we'll calculate the rate here. But notice that there are no P waves that are preceding each QRS complex, okay? No clear P waves before each one, okay? We said this is a regular rhythm, and we can tell that because if you look at these R to R intervals, okay, so from one R wave to the next R wave, we call that a R to R interval. Uh, these intervals are about the same, okay? So notice that the interval duration, okay, is the same. And so this is a regular rhythm. The complexes are narrow in this case, in this case, the QRS complexes. Remember, for our P waves here, here's our P wave, QRS complex, and T wave. The duration is from beginning to end, and we want that less than 120 milliseconds is normal, or three of those small boxes here, all right? Now, there could be some uh, interventricular conduction day delay that's already present and may widen it, but normally you'll see it to be narrow. All right, so what else? We said no P waves. We said a regular rhythm. These complexes are narrow in this case, okay? And then we have to calculate the ventricular rate. So let's calculate the rate here. So do you recall how to calculate the rate? We have a regular rhythm, so there's a few ways we can do it. We know from beginning to end here, is 10 seconds and 10 seconds times 6 is 60 seconds which we know is one minute what that means is if you count the ventricular complexes going across the QRS or T waves multiply that by 6 you can get an estimate of the rate in beats per minute so let's do that here so we have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 and 19, all right? And then we would do 19 times six, and that should give you something of about 114 beats per minute, okay? And as you can see, that number there is certainly over 100 fitting in this junctional tachycardic uh, range, okay? So that's one way you can find the rate. And remember, there's because this is a regular rhythm, there are also, there's another way we can use it. I think this way, the first way that we just showed is good to know if you learn any way because it can, you can apply that to irregular rhythms as well. Now, the other way we said is we can find one of the complexes, the QRS complexes that falls on one of the thick lines. And if you look at this one here, okay? So if I just erase that, you can see that this complex here falls on this thick line and then you want to find the next R wave, which is this here. And you want to count the number of the thick lines or these darker shaded lines between them. So one, two, and it's between two and three. And you would do 300 over that number. So if it's two, it's about 150, okay, beats per minute. And 300 over three is 100 beats per minute. And as you can see, it's actually between these two and three. So it's somewhere between 100 and 150 beats per minute. And we got 114. So that's quite close to the actual rate here. The anyways, the main thing you want to note is this is a fast rhythm above 100 beats per minute that we'd see in adults. And this is what we call a junctional tachycardia. All right, so let's review before we end here. So AV junctional tachycardia is simply a junctional rhythm 
Okay, so a regular, often narrow complex tachycardia that has a ventricular rate of over 100 beats per minute. The P waves are often absent or buried within the QRS complex, and if they're present, they may be seen immediately before or after, and they may have an altered P wave morphology, and the axis may be shifted. All right, so the main thing you want to keep in mind here when differentiating these junctional rhythms is once you identify those criteria is differentiating it based on rate. Remember, less than 40 beats per minute, junctional bradycardia, 40 to 60 beats per minute is that normal intrinsic rate, junctional rhythm. For, uh, 60 to 100 is accelerated junctional rhythm. And the one we discussed here, over 100 beats per minute is AV junctional tachycardia. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay? So this is our website. And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute. And this is the course here over here so you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so and that's more on youtube there's another 100 more than 100 about 200 videos that are available with the course so those are separate videos and this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter okay so completely separate from what you're getting online for free okay these are um, course material that comes with it so notice that you have a book Okay, and then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. And it's used now among many institutions. So use uh, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference. Okay, this was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows. Uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay, a lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling, so uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay, you can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. 
Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right. Have a great day.